It's, a, it's an incredible honor to be here this evening with exceptional leaders like Andrew, Sophie, and my good friend Marat. I expect that some of you might have been a bit surprised to see my name on the program. No one was more surprised about this award than I was. And it caused me to think, how does a kid who was born in New Denver and who spent my early formative years in Canal Flats end up in a dinner where you're celebrating and recognizing public policy? For those of you who are about to Google, Canal Flats and New Denver are small communities in the East Kootenays. Total population last time I looked uh, combined of the two communities, 1,106. Uh, not a place where public policy was the topic for dinnertime conversation. Nor was it the topic at our dinner table when we moved to Coquitlam where I went to high school during the school years and spent my summers as a wrangler, but a lot of you didn't know that, a wrangler uh, on the Spatsizi Plateau, arm in arm, side by side with our colleagues and friends from the Shimsham Nation. My first interaction with public policy was when there was extensive press coverage by the, the, about the then Minister of Justice, Pierre Trudeau, and some comments that were attributed to him along the lines of the state has no place in the bedrooms of its citizens. As a youngster, I thought, technical term, it was icky that the government was going to be in my bedroom watching me sleep. And I can remember quite distinctly having a conversation with my mother about this, who explained that they actually weren't going to be in our bedroom watching us sleep. But in fact, what the government was trying to do was make laws so that as Canadians, we could live the lives that we wanted to live as long as we didn't harm anyone. Little did I know that my mom was actually foreshadowing what for me personally has been the most transformative and influential piece of public policy in my lifetime. The matrix of human rights legislation across our country uh, in British Columbia, of course, introduced in 1973 and in the federal jurisdiction introduced in 1979 under the then Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau. That legislation said to the world that this is a country that recognizes us for our potential, not limited by demographic characteristics such as race, religion, or gender. It says to us as a country that we need to build our economy, we need to build our communities and our society by capturing the potential and pursuing the opportunities that every single citizen can bring to our country. It actually might have been quite helpful had that legislation been in place when I was in high school, and the guide, which it wasn't, and the guidance teacher asked us to talk about what we wanted to do when we graduated from high school. Quite proudly and passionately, I announced that I wanted to be a physician, in fact, a surgeon. That was before I dissected the cow's eye, uh, which forever put an end to my medical aspirations. And uh, she said to me, well, why would you want to do that? And I gave her the answer that I wanted to help people and I wanted to work in the public domain and I thought it was really interesting. And she looked a little bit askew at me and very perplexed and she said, I think you need to reconsider. And um, not being raised to be a shy retiring violet, I um, said, well, why would you think I'd need to reconsider? And she said, well, Sue, um, actually, to be a doctor, you have to go to school for a long time. And if you're able to succeed in going to school for a long time, then you have to work really hard. So you might want to think about a job that's better for girls. I hope that no children of yours or grandchildren or loved ones ever have a conversation like that. I hope that no guidance counselor now will ever condition our children to say that their opportunity is defined in part by demographic characteristics. Don't get me wrong, I know we have a long way to go, but this kind of public policy helps shape families, it shapes individuals, it shapes society, and through that, and as was said earlier this evening, social policy is actually a foundation for good economic policy. We need not look too far 
to see how fragile these social policies can be, how quickly they can be marginalized, how quickly we can actually sharpen the lens and define individuals' roles in our country and in our economy and their potential by the color of their skin, their religion, or their ethnicity or gender. I will never give up supporting public policy that makes sure that every Canadian can contribute to the society in the way that they choose as long as they don't harm each other. My next major interaction with public policy, fast forward, was 1984. And that was when, as a baby lawyer, I was given the file and made responsible for figuring out how we could build the Expo 86 site in a way that the then Premier had declared would be done with a balance of union and non-union labor. Now that might sound kind of easy these days, but for those of you that are old enough to remember, that was about a year after Operation Solidarity, which basically shut down the province as unionized labor and non-union labor uh, went to war with each other and declared uh, they would never before, never later, be on the same construction site together. And yet our premier at the time declared that the only way we are going to get the Expo 86 site built is if we actually work together. Gutsy, provocative, contrarian, and visionary at the time to say the only way we are going to move our economy forward in British Columbia is if we work together. The economic equivalent of human rights legislation to say that we must find the potential in all of our organizations regardless of whether they are small or large, regardless of whether they are public sector or private sector, union or non-unionized, the way we will build this economy is by working together. And we did. We managed to figure out how to build the, the Expo 86 site and host an event from, I think it was May to October of 1986 that I think changed this economy and changed this province like no other events had before or subsequent until we had the, uh, the Olympics. And so here I am now in the role with the digital technology supercluster, which in and of itself is visionary, gutsy, and courageous public policy. And I'm not saying that because I work there. I work there because I chose to support this public policy, because I actually believe that if we are going to capture the opportunity that waits for us on the horizon for Canada and for British Columbia, we are going to have to figure out how to work together. We are gonna to have to figure out how we can bring small entrepreneurial companies who quite frankly, and I work with a lot of them now, they are very unusual. I've not worked with this kind of group before. Bill Tam, who is the co-founder of our organization, um, schools me daily on how to interact with our innovative uh, our innovators and our entrepreneurs in the tech sector and beyond. And the opportunity from this group to work with academic institutions, to work with public sector institutions, and to work with private sector in organizations, small and large, is absolutely spellbinding. It is remarkable to see the traction that we already have. How long have I been there? Four, four months? Three months? Four months. I've been there four months. Um, in four months, we have gone from a concept that was brought to life by Bill and Greg Cause and some others, and we now have uh, momentarily, next week, uh, the first cycle of projects to go to our board for approval, and shortly thereafter, I hope that we will uh, come to an agreement with the federal government so that we can actually launch this, and you will be impressed and amazed at the ingenuity, the innovation, the spirit and the determination that groups of companies in this province have achieved in identifying technologies that will change how healthcare is delivered, improve the efficiency, the sustainability and the productivity of our natural resources sector, and change how we look at industrial uh, manufacturing in this province, something that we don't talk about very often. So in short, I am the product without question, a visionary, gutsy, and courageous public policy. Whether that be in the human rights context where we must continue to protect the rights of every individual to pursue their opportunity, or whether it's in the economic 
uh, context where we must learn to work together and to capture the incredible differences that come together and great, build great opportunities. These are part and parcel public policy. One without the other does not build an economy. One without the other does not build societies or create inspired families. Everything I do in my life, I do to build a better British Columbia for my children and all of their friends. And in today's connected world, that's all of your kids or your grandkids or your next door neighbor's kids, uh, if you choose not to acknowledge your own. Uh, and I will forever protect, defend, and support gutsy, courageous public policy that builds a better economy because that's the way we build a better society for our kids. Thank you very, very much. I'm really, really honored to be here.